TKO's episode 40. We are live. I'm your host, Shane Gillette, on this beautiful afternoon in the valley. And we got a solid show for you today. A lot of Apex action. We're going to talk about some fights that have been announced. We have the Bellator Belfast this weekend that we'll talk about a little bit. UFC Fight Night Vegas 88. We will recap and preview UFC Fight Night Vegas 89. Living with a couple weeks of Apex action before we get a Fight Night Atlantic City card and get near the much-anticipated UFC 300. Again, uh, for those of you that are tuning in to the YouTube podcast channel, please like, subscribe. Really goes a long ways. Um, if you uh, are liking my content on social media, uh, Instagram, Twitter, we usually post Matchmaker Monday I do two fights that I think, you know, two of them are the headlines, co-main or main, uh, who they should fight after, and Thursday thoughts, just random things that I like to talk about to try to spark a little controversy or conversation. And then if you're listening via the audio, anywhere you're streaming podcasts, please check out um, subscribing, leaving a review would mean a ton. Wild that we're already on episode 40. Time has been flying, but let's jump right in. We have uh, a fight booked. Jose Aldo coming out of retirement. Did not see that one on my bingo card. Uh, Taking on Jonathan Martinez for UFC 301 in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, is going to be a fantastic striking battle, leg kicking battle. Really excited for that fight. Um, A little shocked Aldo coming back into the fight game. But I guess at the same time, not that shocked. Uh, a man we talked about on last episode, Robelis to Spain. Coming in, making light work, getting a quick turnaround, and going to take on Waldo Acosta Cortez, May 11th, which is an announced fight night card in St. Louis. So that is going to be a lot of fun for the May card. We have Tim Means taking on Yorosh Madik, uh, April 27th. High quality f- uh, about there. A win for either of those men is going to be big for their careers. We have Alex Perez taking on Tagir Olenbekov in the June 15th card. Um, that'll be a great flyweight showdown. Good to see Tagir being a little active here. For the big boys, we got Ryan Spann and Bogdan Guskov uh, on the April 27th card. And then it's been announced that Walt Harris will be suspended for four years. Uh, this will be retroactive a little bit. But he had some tests in USADA, oversighted it a little bit in 2023, so he will have a four-year suspension. I uh, would be as shocked if he came back and fought after that, as he's already in his 30s. After the loss last weekend, Brian Barberena and Josh Parisian off the UFC rosters. You know, most likely, probably for good. Uh, maybe Brian with the contract situation and get a new contract, he's welcomed back. Um, but. Two guys that have uh, have had their fingerprints on the UFC uh, no longer on the roster. And then this weekend, we have a Bellator card on Friday, live on Dazen. Uh, recently, uh, Bellator has announced all Bellator fights will be on Max, which was the HBO Max subscription that's just now called Max. Decent little card. Not too sure if I'll watch it or not. But we have uh, ex-UFC or Corey Anderson going for the title shot against Carl Moore. You know, I don't even know who Carl Moore is, so that's kind of where Bellator is at these these days. We get a title fight for Patricio Pitbull, who is supposed to be on the champion's card but had an injury, taking on Jeremy Kennedy. We have Fabian Edwards taking on Aaron Jeffrey. We have uh, PFL and Cage Fairy alum Manel Sosa, who's undefeated at 10-0, taking on Tim Wilde. And Tafik Musayev taking on Alfie Davis. So some decent fights. I'd assume Corey, Patricio, Fabian, and Sousa win, and Tafik. That's my guess, but decent little card if you're trying to get some extra fight action. But let's recap last weekend's card. 
UFC Fight Night Vegas 88. I rode heavy with the dogs and the dogs bit me. I went 3-7 and seven in my picks, the second worst card since Bows and TKOs has started. That puts us on the year at 59 wins, 34 losses, and 3 no contests or draws. On the overall uh, 40 episodes deep, 252 and 120, so I'm still doubled up, uh, more wins and losses, 6 no contests or draws. Some good fights that we did not break down. We had Jacqueline Amarim with a round one submission via armbar over Corey McKenna. That was a pick I got wrong, although we did not break it down. I picked Corey McKenna. Uh, Jacqueline looking great in that fight. Uh, Danny Silva with a split decision over Josh Kulabau. Pretty savage fight. That was another fight I picked wrong. And then we had Mike Davis with a round two submission via arm triangle choke. Your boy's favorite submission over Nathan Levy. So moving into the prelims, we have Tiago Moises with a round three TKO over Mitch Ramirez. And although this lasted around three, this was a very lopsided bout. It was a short notice affair for Mitch in his UFC debut. You know, a little bit of a bummer here as I was really excited to see Tiago face Brad Riddell in his return fight. So, you know, that happens. That's the fight game. Um, but Tiago had Mitch's leg exposed early. He had major, major swelling on it from the leg kicks and calf kicks by round two. And Tiago having his way with an immobile opponent, getting his boxing going, was able to grapple. He finally got the finish at the beginning of round three because Mitch's leg was completely done for. That, that was chop suey. So statistically, it took Tiago 53 total strikes, 25 of them significant. He had two takedowns, a submission attempt, and a knockdown. And Mitch landed 28 total strikes, 16 of those significant. So Tiago now ends his losing streak, starts a new winning streak. He moves to 3-1 since 2022. And Mitch starts a new losing streak, losing his UFC debut and his Contender Series audition. We'll be interested to see if for taking that fight on short notice, he has another chance at the UFC or not. He's running out of lives. So what's next? Well, I really have no idea what the Brad Riddell situation is going to be, if he's going to be ready anytime soon. But if he is, I would really like to see that fight be rebooked. If not, Tiago could take on Drew Dober. Uh, that would be a classic banger, and I'm here all for it. Um, and, uh, you know, to Mitch's point, not sure if he's going to be in the UFC. Usually they do give a guy a couple fights. If they take a fight on short notice, they get the win. The UFC wants to have him under contract. So how about a scrap with Vince Pichel? Moving on. Um, at least I got Tiago right. Did not get this fight right. We had Hafel Filio with a round one submission via rear naked choke over Odie Osborne. Performance of the night. 50 G's for Hafel. And a lot on this card. I mean, it was uh, the grapplers getting full advantage of the fights. That definitely was the case here for Hafel. He got an early takedown, and immediately I was like, oh, man, there goes that pick. Uh, he was able to pretty easily progress positions once he got the takedown and find the submission right before the end of the round. I figured Odie would do better with his footwork, you know, having long attacks to keep Hoffel at range, and that, that definitely wasn't the case. Hoffel got in there pretty easily uh, and got the neck. So statistically, it took Hoffel 43 total strikes, 21 of them significant. He had a takedown two submission attempts, and three minutes and 21 seconds of control time. So a minute and a half is all it took for him to get a takedown. And o Odie only landed one strike. Tough day in the octagon for Odie Osborne. So Hafel extends his winning streak to two. He's three and one in the UFC. You know, almost undefeated after the, the knee bar that he had against Muhammad Makayev. But Muhammad would not tap, came away at the finish. So he's actually on quite a quite a good little trajectory here in the N or the NFL in the UFC, and Odie extends his losing streak to two. He is two and three since 2022. So I'd like to see Hafel move up a little bit, take on Cody Durden, and for Odie, how about Felipe dos Santos? That would be a great clash of styles, a fun striking battle there. Moving on, in the last prelim fight, we had Chelsea Chandler with the unanimous decision over Josanne Nunez. And 
much like the Phil Filio fight, this was just another grappler turning this fight into a, a, a grappling match, executing her game plan, staying away from damage against a solid striker. I just, much like Odie, thought Josan was going to be too fast, was going to find shots, maybe rock Chelsea early, you know, keep her guessing, but that really wasn't the case at all. Uh, this was pretty lopsided, the worst loss for uh, Nunez in her UFC career. Chelsea landed 100 total strikes, 58 of them significant. She had two takedowns and seven minutes and two seconds of control time, so an entire round of control time. And Jozan landed 49 total strikes, 47 of those significant, so um, less than half the total and 11 less significant strikes. When she could strike, she was throwing bombs. So Chelsea ends her losing streak. She starts a new winning streak. She is 3-1 since 2022. She moves up one spot in the rankings to number 13. And Josanne ends her nine-fight winning streak. It's got to be tough. That's her first UFC loss. She is 3-1 in the UFC. Moves down one spot in the rankings to number 14. Well, next, I'd like to see Chelsea take on Carol Hosa. And for Nunez, how about Julia Avila? That set us up for the main card. Kicking off the main card, another fight I got wrong riding with the dog. We had Gerald Mearshart with a round two submission via rear naked choke over Brian Barberena. And I just really had a feeling, you know, both of these dudes, kind of veterans, in for fun fights, have to fight a lot of young up-and-comers. They really need to have their moment and some momentum in the UFC. I figured Gerald was going to think that his striking was good enough to hang with Brian, but clearly the vet didn't want to take that chance whatsoever. He wanted to get Brian down because Brian has shown he's susceptible to the takedowns. He's improved. He defended pretty good in this fight. And then he was going to get, let the jiu-jitsu do the rest of the talking. And uh, Gerald never really let Brian get going. He was relentless with getting Brian up against the cage, looking for the takedown. And that was a good, smooth path to victory. So Gerald landed 30 total strikes, 11 of them significant with three takedowns and seven attempts. So Brian, you know, battling, defended four takedowns. Uh, GM3 had two submission attempts and five minutes and three seconds of control time. So pretty much that entire first round. And Brian landed 25 total strikes, 12 of them significant. So more significant strikes, almost the same amount of strikes, but it did not matter. Gerald now puts a quick stop to his two-fight losing streak and starts a new winning streak. He is now 2-3 and three since 2022. And Brian extends his losing streak to four. He has been active, though. He's 2-4, and four, six fights since 2022. So where do these guys go next? Uh, for Gerald... I think Brad Tavares would be a ton of fun, a good stylistic matchup, a guy who could grapple as well. I'm actually surprised those two haven't fought each other yet. And for Brian, supposedly he's released in the UFC. If it's a contract thing, maybe he could get another striker and take on a fight against someone like Abdul Razak Al Hassan. Moving on, another woman affair here. We had Macy Shiasen with a round one submission via rear naked choke over Panny Kianzad. Performance of the night, 50 Gs for Macy. And this literally was the Ultimate Fighter finale rematch all over again, but uh, Macy actually got the finish in round one, not round two. Uh, and that was five and a half years ago. And, you know, when you beat somebody, although people can change and you, you know, it's been some time. There's really that confidence that you have coming into that matchup. And you could tell Macy was super confident. She knew she was going to get a takedown. She was going to get a sub submission. And that's exactly what happened. I honestly thought, though, Penny would be a little bit more prepared for that. I thought she was going to move more, let her hands fly more, which she really didn't. She, she wasn't moving as much as you'd think when she's taking on a grappler, someone she's already faced. And I thought she would let her technical striking flourish, and that really wasn't the case. Not a lot of things happening here. I mean, Macy landed five total strikes, four of them significant. She had two takedowns, a submission attempt, a reversal, and two minutes and 28 seconds of control time. Penny landed 29 total strikes, only two of them significant. She had a takedown and two attempts. 
So Macy now starts a new winning streak. She is 2-1 since 2022. She moves up four spots in the rankings to number six. And Panny extends her losing streak to two. She is 1-2 two since 2022 and moves down three spots in the rankings to number nine. I think with a performance like that, Macy has earned her shot against Misha Tate. I think that would be a fun matchup. Misha would be happy with that. And for Panny, she could take on Yana Santos. So the card overall this far, I mean, obviously Mitch didn't deserve to be in there with Tiago. It was a short notice thing. Hoffeld, Chelsea, GM3, and Macy all grappled their way to victory. I'm not a, a downer of grappling. I'm definitely one of the, the few that are pro-grappling. It's just stylistically and a lot of excitement. It was just a lot of domination, not a lot of strikes being landed. Uh, somewhat of a clunker thus far. And then we had a, a wild fight. Uh, we had Christian Rodriguez with a split decision over Isaac Dolgarian. And this was a fight I actually got right, but I don't think Christian won the fight. I mean, Isaac came in and completely dominated the first two rounds with his grappling heavy attack. He even almost finished Christian early in round one. Uh, but Rodriguez, you know, he, he's a dog and he, he showed that he, he he's never going to give up and he, keep, he kept doing what he's been doing. And that's just outlasting his opponents. By round three, he was able to get the momentum going. He was dominating a gassed out Isaac with his striking. He went for the finish, but ran a little bit out of time. You, you just really wanted him to get that finish. You know, no issues with the scoring. But it, this is a round-based scoring. I think Isaac completely dominated rounds one and two. He won two rounds to uh, Christian's three. Well, you could say Christian had a 10-8 uh, round in round three. Well, if that's the case, then Isaac had a 10-8 round in round one. So um, really bad scorecard here. I'll take the dub, though. I would have been 2-8. and eight. Um, But, you know, it, it's just funny thinking that after round one, you're like, man, Isaac's going to cruise to a decision. Worst case uh, with the judges, but he should get the finish. Round three, Christian was able to weather the storm. Uh, tie, you know, work on a tired Isaac. Um, but brutal for Isaac. Good young career, taking a loss. He'll be back. Uh, this kid's going to be a problem. Statistically, Isaac landed 56 total strikes, 22 of those significant. He had seven takedowns and 16 attempts. I mean, you want to talk about a gas tank. You, you can't be gassing out in a 15-minute fight, only three rounds. But 16 attempts, that, that could do the trick. Um, you know, just a little bit less than 50%. So Christian was defending well. Uh, two submission attempts for Isaac and nine minutes and 22 seconds of control time. So almost two full rounds. And Christian landed a good amount of strikes, 97 total, 48 of those significant. So almost doubled up Isaac's totals, but that all came in round three because he was just defending strikes rounds one and round two. And then in round three, Christian had three minutes and 19 seconds of control time. So almost, uh, you know, more than half a round there. So Christian extends his winning streak to four. He's four and one in the UFC. And Isaac suffers his first pro loss, ends his six fight winning streak. He is now one and one in the UFC. Well, I think Christian would, uh, and Ryan Hall would be a good fight if Ryan Hall is ever going to fight again. If Ryan Hall doesn't, uh, Sung Woo Choi, I think, would be a great matchup for Christian as well. And for Isaac, I'd love to see him fight Josh Kulabal, who also fought and lost on this card. That would be a, a, a savage fight. The, the volume there would be insane. Moving on, we had the veteran with the shocker here, an underdog I did not pick that got the victory, another fight I got wrong. We had OSP with a split decision win over Kennedy and Shekwaku. And this was just kind of a weird fight. I didn't expect it to play out like this at all. It was a very slow fight. Kennedy wasn't willing to take much risks, which against the older fighter, he's got a, a length advantage. You know, I thought he would be doing that. He was just kind of chilling in the pocket, jabbing away, jabbing away. Not many combos, not many risky moves, no kicks. And the, the entire fight was really close. Uh, but OSP was willing to just stay in range and throw. And, and he knew, he felt Kennedy's power, knew he was able to take that power and deliver more strikes back. Finally, by round three, these guys let loose a little bit. We're exchanging pretty well. Um, both guys rocked each other decently, but OSP was able to come out with the best of the strikes. 
And to be honest, what I've seen from Kennedy lately on his rise and, and the way he's fought, I'm not sure what his game plan was in this fight. You know, maybe he just froze up in the octagon. You know, that it could be tough in the apex. It's quiet in there. Not much, you know, uh, energy. Um, just too many variables in play. But I was just shocked by Kennedy's performance. Statistically, OSP landed 143 total and significant strikes. He was 0 for 2 in his takedown attempts. He had the knockdown as well, which pretty much won him the fight. And Kennedy landed 106 total and significant strikes. He was 0 for 1 in takedown attempts. So OSP starts a new winning streak. He is 2 and 1 since 2022. Hasn't been very active, but he's getting up there in age. And Kennedy extends his losing streak to 2. He is 3 and 3 since 2022. He's been he's been active. So um, for OSP, I think you got to take on another OG. You deserve to get a, an OG. I think a fight with Dustin Jacoby would be the perfect fight. And for Kennedy, I mean, those two with how much they fought in other circuits too, it's kind of surprising they haven't fought. But for Kennedy, how about Marcin Procnio? I think that would be a good next step for him. And with all the grappling... Um, you know, this fight kind of being a clunker until the round three, you're like, all right, let's see what Brian Battle has, the Apex King. Well, we get a no contest against Angelusa. Uh, quite a bummer, really, just really sucked the air out of this card, in my opinion. Um, the first round was pretty active between both men. Brian definitely was in control, whether it was striking him in the clinch with Ange up against the cage. He even got a takedown. Then early in round two, Ainge got his eye poked with only 30 seconds left, um, or only 30 seconds into his five-minute stoppage. He said he couldn't see, which is like the worst thing to do. You know, get a towel, rub it off, give yourself some time. So they called off the fight immediately, which I hate that, but I guess you can't be saying that. Um, you know, I don't think the ref should call it off right away. Like, hey, can, you know, okay, you can't see. Like, what are we going to do here? Give him a chance, you know? Uh, but it seemed like Ainge really didn't want to have that chance. Uh, but you got to give your, yourself a time, you know, time to fix whatever's going on. Groin strike eye. You can't just say, I, I can't do anything. Um, that gives the ref the opportunity to, to stop the fight. And uh, there was a little bit of chaos afterwards as Brian acted like he was completely dominating Ainge. Uh, after it was called off, he was super hot. You know, that's understandable. You don't get paid your win bonus. You put all this time in. You're paying coaches, paying nutrition, uh, you know, all, all the, the damage on your body just to get there through fight camp. And now it's called off. You probably would have got a win bonus, maybe a performance bonus. Um, but he acted like he was completely dominating. I want to say that was the case. It seemed like he was on his way to win. Uh, but, but they were talking smack in the octagon, and there was a lot of beef there that was done. But... You could debatably say Ainge, Ainge just wasn't trying to have it. Um, Brian landed 28 total strikes, 27 of those significant. He had a takedown. He was one for two. And Ainge had 28 total strikes, 23 of those significant. He was 0 for 1 in takedowns. So the same amount of total strikes. Brian had four more significant with a takedown and some clinch time. So again, not complete domination like he was acting. But both Ange and Brian stay on their two-fight winning streaks. I would like to see this fight booked as soon as possible again, but it, ha you know, it hasn't been booked this far, so who knows? Uh, you think you're like, hey, let's turn around this next time in the next Apex fight. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Then in the main event, another underdog shocker. I did not pick this dog. We had Marcin Tibero with a round one submission via rear naked choke over Ty to Avasa. Main event performance of the night for Marcin. And Ty did what he was going to do, though. He said he was head hunting, looking for a finish, and he really went for it at the start of the fight. He did have some nice shots. He landed, cut Marcin early um, with an elbow up against the cage. He did get a little sloppy and overly aggressive, though, which gave Tybira, you know, who's a very slick veteran, fought a lot of fights, been there, done that with a lot of strikers, and, you know, you just want to wait till, till Ty gasses out a little bit. Well... Ty was getting overly aggressive and he got an opening to get a takedown. And that was it as Ty, you know, isn't very good off his back. He was able to control position pretty simply and get the rear naked choke. Uh, tough, 
moment for Ty, especially with the skid that he's on. But Ty landed 18 total strikes, 15 of those significant, compared to Marchin's 73 total, 27 of those significant with a takedown and four attempts. So Ty tried to defend as he could. Uh, and then he had the submission attempt in 2 minutes and 48 seconds of control time. Marchin now starts a new winning streak. He is 3-1 since 2022. And he moves up two spots in the rankings to number nine. Ty extends his losing streak to four. He hasn't won since February of 22. And he moves down one spot in the rankings to number 10. Again, tough skid for Ty Tuavasa. So where do these guys go next? Well, I think Marchin and Jaelton Almeida, that is the next fight to make. Uh, that'd be an interesting one stylistically. And for Ty, if he is still around, which... I'm sure he can be just with the hype he has. Give us a banger. Give us Ty Bam Bam to Avasa and the striking heavy biggie boy, Jarzinho Rosenstrike. So that sets us up for another Apex card, UFC Fight Night Vegas 89, a little bit earlier of a start. Prelims at 1 p.m. Pacific, main card at 4 p.m., all on ESPN+. Plus. And it's not a very deep card, some decent toss-up fights, but... Probably not even as good as the last card, just on an outsider looking in. So there's no fights that we won't break down that are very worth mentioning. You know, when I say there's good fights, it's like, hey, I'm not quite breaking these down, but there's some intrigue here. Maybe some young fighters I don't know a lot about that aren't much to say to break down on the pod, but, you know, keep your eyes out or there's a good stylistic matchup or something. Nothing really besides what we're breaking down. But we're going to kick this bad boy off in the prelims. We got Mohammed. The Motor Usman, 34 years old with a 11 and 2 record, taking on Mick Parkin, 28 years old with an undefeated 8 and 0 record. Now this is going to be an interesting tip for tap fight in my opinion. We got two heavyweights who are trying to burst onto the scene, decent strikers. Muhammad, a big, massively strong dude. Obviously, you know his brother, uh, one of the best welterweight champs of all time. And Mick Parkin, who trains with Tom Aspinall, who is the interim heavyweight champion. The big difference in this fight is Mick is entering his prime, while Muhammad's pretty much in it at the later stages. So in my opinion, more on the line for Muhammad. And um, Mick, you know, he's still growing. So so that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Breaking this down, Muhammad is a Titan FC PFL and Ultimate Fighter alum and champion. Uh, he is on a three-fight winning streak. He's 3-0 in the UFC since the Ultimate Fighter. And Mick is a Contender Series alum. He's obviously undefeated on an eight-fight winning streak, 3-0 in the UFC. Five of his eight wins are via knockout. Now, Mick is young, undefeated, so he's full of confidence. He has a lot of power, but really hasn't finished anyone in the UFC. Uh, and his uh, Contender Series victory came via rear naked choke. I do think Usman has too good of a team, too much experience to not come away with this fight. Mick has a high, higher ceiling and I think will have a better overall career. But Muhammad's going to be too much with them. He's going to be jabbing and moving and his ability to get a decision here at this point in their career seems likely for me. So I'm taking the underdog. I'm taking Muhammad Usman and I'm avoiding him on a parlay where possible. Moving on. We have Miles Chapo Johns, 29 years old with a 13 and 2 record, taking on Cody the Renegade Gibson, 36 years old with a 20 and 9 record. Now this is Miles' chance to get on a run in his prime at, at 29 years old. He's only had back-to-back -back wins in the UFC one time, and this is Cody's last chance in the UFC. He was had a UFC stunt, left for a while was on the last Ultimate Fighter season with the Veterans Group, where he lost in the finale, and he has not been in the UFC since 2014. Breaking this down, Miles is an Orthodox fighter. He's an LFA alum and former champion. He's also a Contender Series alum. He's on a one-fight winning streak because his last fight was overturned after he tested positive for uh, Turnbull. And Cody has a brown belt in BJJ. He was the Ultimate Fighter 31 runner-up. He's a Titan FC, LFA, and Eagle FC alum. 
He's on a one fight losing streak and is three and two since 2021 outside of the UFC. Seven of his 19 wins are via knockout. Four of his nine losses are via submission. He does have a three inch reach advantage in this fight and a three and a half inch leg reach advantage. Now, Cody is a very well-rounded fighter, but it's hard to think he's going to pull off a win here versus someone entering their prime, full of confidence, and is pretty solid all around as well. I do think Cody's best option in this fight is going to keep Miles at distance, maybe look to grapple him, but Miles did a good job against a really good grappler in his last bout against Dan Ar Argueta. For that reason, I'm taking Miles, Chapo Johns. I'm putting him on that parlay. We marking that ish down, and we getting that bread. Moving on. We have Ricardo Ca uh, Carson Serena Ramos, 28 years old with a 16-5 and five record. He's taking on Julian Juicy J. Arosa, 34 years old with a 28-12 and 12 record. Now, this is actually a very fun matchup between two very technical fighters. You know, Ricardo is seeking a quality win, get some momentum as he's entering his prime at 28. And Julian is on one of the worst skids of his career in the middle of his prime at 34. But he has looked good overall since 2021. Breaking it down, Ricardo trains at a Team Alpha male. He has a black belt in BJJ. He's a legacy FC alum. He's on a one-fight winning streak and is 1-1 one one since 2022. Seven of his 16 wins are via submission. Now, Julian trains out of Extreme Couture. He's a King of the Cage, Cage Warriors, Contender Series, and Ultimate Fighter alum. He's on a two-fight losing streak and is 2-2 two and two since 2022. 11 of his 28 wins are via knockout, 12 via submission, so 23 of his 28 wins are via finish. Seven of his 11 losses are via knockout. Now, Julian's been there with some quality opponents. He's had some good wins like Hakeem Dawudu, Charles Jordan, Nate Landaware, and Sean Woodson. But that was when they were all young. He's a true MMA veteran. He's dangerous. He's going to come in with a good game plan. Ricardo's a little bit of a wild card. He's got that wild striking, lots of spinning techniques. I imagine he's going to look for a finish and look to bring a lot of volume in this fight. I've gone back and forth. I am taking Ricardo Hamos, but I'm avoiding him on a parlay where possible. Then we get another Ultimate Fighter veteran alum, Kurt the Hurt Hollabaugh, 37 years old with a 21 and 7 record. He's taking on Trey the Samurai Ghost Ogden, 34 years old with a 16 and 6 record. So this is more of a veteran clash between two men. They got a lot on the line, a ton to prove to stay with the UFC. Kurt is looking solid and has some good momentum after winning the Ultimate Fighter 31, but he hasn't, hasn't done much uh, before that since his UFC release. Breaking these men down, Kurt has a black belt in BJJ. He's an Orthodox fighter, Titan FC alum. He was a Titan FC interim champ and Contender Series alum. He's on a three-fight winning streak, um, two in the XFC, and then his Ultimate Fighter finale. We could say five if you include all of his Ultimate Fighter fights. Ten of his 20 wins are via submission, seven via knockout, so 17 of his 20 wins via finish. Very impressive for the Hurt. Now, Trey is also a Titan FC, Bellator, LFA, and Fury FC alum. He's on a one-fight losing streak with a no contest. 11 of his 16 wins are via submission. Three of his six losses are also via submission. To submit or be submitted. Now, this is going to be an ugly dogfight. It'll probably mostly be a striking affair. I've really gone back and forth here, but Kurt really impressed me in the Ultimate Fighter to not think he would come out as the winner. I think he's going to outlast Trey. I think Trey's going to go heavy early on and maybe gas himself out. And Kurt might find a way to even get a finish late round two or round three. For that reason, I'm taking another underdog after getting bit last week. They're coming to eat. I'm taking Kurt the Hurt Hullabo 
but I am not putting him on a parlay where possible. Moving on to the main card. We got Billy Quarantillo, 35 years old with an 18-5 and record, taking on Yusuf, the Moroccan Devil Zalal, 27 years old with a 13-5 and record. Now, this is going to be a fun striking battle. I think it's going to be back and forth chaos. Billy had an opponent set for March 23rd, and Yusuf had stepped into this fight. Now, this is a tough matchup for a short notice fight, but should be an even uh, more exciting matchup. Breaking it down, Billy has a black belt in BJJ. He's a king of the cage, contender series, and ultimate fighter alum. He's on a one fight winning streak, but is one and two or two and one since 2022. Eight of his 18 wins are via knockout, five via submission, so 13 of his 18 wins via finish. Now, Yusuf is an orthodox fighter. He trains out of Factory X. He's a purple belt in BJJ. He's an LFA alum. He's been out of the UFC since August of 2022, but he has racked up three quick wins since in the Sparta Combat League. Six of his 13 wins are via submission, four via knockout, so 10 of his 13 wins come via finish. Now, Yusuf, although he's only... 27 years old is fighting for a chance to return to the UFC again at only 27 this is probably the biggest moment of his UFC career and Billy is going to be ready to rock so I expect some fun exchanges and a bunch of volume here it's a close fight but I'm going with the veteran Billy Quarantillo we are putting him on that parlay we marking that ish down and we getting that bread moving on we have Peyton Talbot, 25 years old, undefeated with a 7-0 record, taking on Cameron MSP Simon, 23 years old with a 9-1 record. Now, these two young men, this is really a showcase in the new era of the UFC. In a very deep bantamweight division, we have two young fighters who are coming into their own, and they're looking to show off their skills in the Apex and win over MMA fans. We have an undefeated fighter versus a recently undefeated fighter uh, who, who has done a lot in his career at 9-1. and one. Breaking it down, Peyton is a A1 and Contender Series alum. He's un A1 is the Uriah Faber promotion. He's undefeated on a 7-fight winning streak, 2-0 in the UFC. He does have a three and a half inch reach advantage in this fight. Five of his seven wins are via knockout. And Cameron is a southpaw fighter. He's a contender series alum. He's on a one fight losing streak and has four and one in the UFC. And he is six and one since 2022. Now Cameron has been super active. He was full of confidence until he lost to Christian Rodriguez. So you know he's going to come out hungry and aggressive in this fight. The problem is that Peyton typically is the aggressor, very in-your-face kind of fighter. I'm really excited to see how this one plays out, but I do think the difference is going to be Peyton striking. For that reason, I'm taking Peyton Talbot. We putting him on that parlay. We marking that ish down, and we getting that bread. I am, though, really interested to see Peyton. Sorry to continue, but I am really, to see, really interested to see his performance here. He's one of those guys that you just you see a lot of that it factor, uh, so it's going to be a ton of fun. And Uriah speaks highly of him. Now we get Edmund, the Golden Boy Shabazian, 26 years old with a 12-4 and record, taking on A.J. Dobson, 32 years old with a 7-2 and record. Now Edmund at this point in his career is a vet fighting in the UFC since 2018. He's still only 26, though and in desperate need of some momentum. And now he gets to fight AJ, who's in the middle of his prime, looking to continue his momentum. Breaking it down, Edmund trains out of Extreme Couture. He has a black belt in Shotokan Karate. Karate. He is a Contender Series alum. He's on a one-fight losing streak and is 1-1 one one since 2022, but 1-4 since 2020. So not super active, spending time in the lab, Really needs those wins. Still only 26. 
10 of his 12 wins are via knockout. Three of his four losses are via knockout to knock out or be knocked out. Now, AJ is a King of the Cage and Contender Series alum. He's on a one-fight winning streak and is 1-2 since 2022. Three of his seven wins are via knockout. Now, I'm excited to see how Edmund has developed his game. You know, it, it's been a year since we last saw him in his loss against Anthony Hernandez. Edmund, he does have very slick striking. He's the more technical striker in this fight. I think he's going to stay at range, find jabs, find a path to victory. He, he is a knockout guy, but maybe go to the judge's scorecard here. For that reason, I'm taking Edmund Shabazian. I am putting him on that parlay. We marking that ish down, and we getting that bread. Moving on. We have Carl Williams, 34 years old with a 9-1 record, taking on Justin Badman Taffa, 30 years old with a 7-3 record. Now, Justin's actually filling in for his brother, Junior, since he filled in for Justin's last fight. So he's taking on a tough heavyweight who's in his prime and hasn't lost since 2021. He's definitely full of confidence, and Carl had his best win against Chase Sherman in May of last year. Breaking it down, Carl trains out of ATT. He's an icon fighting and contender series alum. He's on a six-fight winning streak and is 3-0 in the UFC. He has a five-inch reach advantage and a three-and-a-half-inch leg reach advantage. Now, Justin has a blue belt in BJJ. He's on a three-fight winning streak with a no contest in between, and all seven of his wins are via knockout. Now, Carl is more of a patient heavyweight fighter. I think he's going to try to use his length to keep the power of Taffa at range, and Justin is going to look to get in close and fire bombs away at Carl. I do think the longer the fight goes, the more it's going to be benefit Carl, and he probably will look to get Taffa down. I do think jo uh, Justin's going to be able to land a bunch of big shots and potentially even get a finish here. For that reason, I'm taking the bad man, Justin Taffa, another underdog. Hoo -hoo. I am not putting him on a parlay, though. Now, this sets us up for the main event. We have Rose Thug Name Yunus, 31 years old with a 12-6 and six record, taking on Amanda Ribas, 30 years old with a 13-4 and four record, and the number eight next to her name. Now, this is going to be an awesome main event. This kind of feels like it really is the first real test for Rose at flyweight. You know, she fought her last fight against Manon Firo and, and looked pretty solid, but she had that mangled, gnarled up finger, and she couldn't even punch with one of her hands. I think it was her left. And Amanda, she's a solid striker. She's tough. She brings a ton of volume. I just think Rose is going to show that there's levels to the striking game and maybe show off a little bit. Now, Rose has a black belt in Taekwondo, a black belt in Karate, a brown belt in BJJ. She was the 2017 and 2021 male, uh, MMA Female Fighter of the Year. She's a former strawweight champion with two successful title defenses. She had the 2017 upset of the year against Joanna Young Jacek. She's the first woman in UFC history to regain a championship title after losing it. And she holds victories over three former UFC women strawweight champions, Joanna Young Jacek, Zhang Weilei, and Jessica Andraj. She had the 2013 MMA submission of the year against Kathina Katron, the 2015 women's MMA submission of the year against Paige Van Zant the 2017 Women's MMA Submission of the Year against Michelle Watterson. She had the 2017 Knockout of the Year against Joanna Young Jacek. She's just a highlight machine. Thug Rose all day. She is an Evicta and Ultimate Fighter alum, and I have a sweet spot in, for her in my heart. When she was on the Ultimate Fighter, she was really young and just a little chaotic, and I was like, she's going to be the champ one day, moved all the way, became one of the most dominant women in UFC history, you know, one of those ones you just, you, you had a feeling and it happened. Makes you feel good. She's on a two-fight losing streak and hasn't won since November of 2021. 
a lot of weird things going on with her and her husband. I think it's her husband. And the coaching and the camps and the game plans. So it's gotten a little sketchy lately. But five of our 11 wins are via submission. Now, Amanda trains out of American Top Team. She has a black belt in BJJ, a black belt in Judo, and she's a Jungle Fight alum and former champ. She's on a one-fight winning streak and is 2-2 two and two since 2022. Three of her four losses are via knockout. Now, the biggest question for me is how Rose is going to approach this fight. You know, she doesn't have Trevor Whitman providing game plans these days. It's her boyfriend, her husband, and I don't really agree with his plans most of the time and just him on the MMA hour and stuff. He just, just, I'm not a big fan. But if Rose is aggressive, she should get another amazing finish. But Amanda is going to make her work for it, especially if the fight goes deep. She's going to bring a ton of volume. I think we're about to see another highlight knockout. Uh, welcome to the flyweight moment. For that reason, I'm taking the former champ, Thug Rose. We putting her on that parlay. We marking that ish down and we getting that bread. Now, after this apex chaos, we finally get a location apex, or fight night card in Atlantic City. This is another women's headliner. We're getting the undefeated Aaron Blanchfield and Manon, Manon Faro as a probably title eliminator fight. It's a more solid fight night card than this. But that's episode 40. I'm your host, Shane Gillette. See you next week.